Welcome to this webinar on, on um, violence against women and 16 days of activism. How can we uh, mobilize against gendered violence? Uh, this uh, webinar is part of a webinar ser series on gender and uh, insecurity. Uh, and there will be another uh, and the very last uh, webinar next week, the 15th of December, uh, on um, uh, women, gender and security and right-wing extremism, on right-wing extremism in this context. But today it's um, the mobilization of, of um, people around and against um, uh, violence against women and gender-based violence that we would like to focus on. Uh, this is part of the annual UN campaign against um, gender-based violence. Uh, it's called 16 Days of Activism every year. And, and uh, uh, this seminar and webinar is part of, of that um, campaign. And the purpose is to look more at the experience in Denmark, look at the status of uh, gender-based violence here in Denmark, and also the experience with mobilizing against it. What can be done? How has it been done? What are successful activities in, in this field? Uh, in a country where many people would argue that gender-based violence is a thing of the far past. So uh, to um, look at this subject, we have uh, three excellent speakers with us um, who will enlighten us in uh, each their capacity. First, uh, Mette Marie Uyde, uh, who is Deputy Director at DANA, will talk on the significance of gender-based violence in Denmark. Secondly, uh, Lise Johansen, who is Director at uh, the Women's Council in Denmark, will look more at uh, mobilizing against gender-based violence. And then thirdly, uh, we have Meron Sileke, Assistant Professor at the Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia, uh, who has worked on this issue for many years and who will provide an international uh, comment on, on our experience in Denmark. She is also part of a research program uh, together with people here at DEES, including myself, on global norms and violence against women. So uh, these three uh, speakers will start off and, and um, each have 15 minutes for, for their presentations. And then subsequently we will have a, a Q&A uh, and there you have the possibility to um, raise questions by um, drawing um, um, uh, the cursor over the screen. You will see there's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And if you press that, um, Button, then you can uh, write your comment and or question, and I will take it up uh, in the Q and A session and present it to the speakers, and in that way we can have a discussion. So, a warm welcome to all of you, and thank you for joining. And the uh, word over to uh, Mette Marie Uze, who will start off the presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Lars, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining this uh, event. Uh, 16 days of activism is uh, always really important to us, being a women's rights organization working with uh, particularly violence against women. I'll just share some slides with you. Um, I'll, I have 15 minutes and I'll do my best to stay within the time. I will focus on three main things. Uh, one is the scope of violence against women in Denmark. Um, then I'll touch upon the, the gender neutralization of gender-based violence in a Danish context and how to understand that, why and why is it a problem. And, uh, and lastly, I'll uh, um, talk a little bit about how we, along with other uh, civil society actors, mobilize to have um, coercive control of psychological violence criminalized almost two years ago in Denmark. So just briefly, uh, I'm from uh, Denmark, and uh, oh, uh, and my slides will not move. Hang on. Did the did the slide? Is it the next slide? Good. Sorry, I had to change view. Sorry about that. So this new digital world we're all trying to, uh, to navigate in. Well, Dana is a women's rights organization based in Copenhagen. 
We are located quite central in a large building that was originally built for the purpose of housing uh, poor women of the working class, built in 1875 by the Countess Dana. And um, we like to view her as uh, one of the first feminists in Denmark, and we build on her rich story. It was uh, then uh, occupied by the women's rights movement in 79. It had served its purpose uh, as a housing facility for the welfare state had taken over uh, the, the responsibility of, of these elderly women. Um, and so for the past 40 years, we have run a shelter out of this building. We have a, a knowledge center or resource center where, that I'm heading. We also have a, a counseling center, which is on a, another address in Copenhagen. Um, and so we house 18 children or 18 women and their children at all times in the shelter here. Um, and then we do also international projects and support other women's rights organization providing support and protection to, to women subjected to particularly intimate partner violence. We, the, we, as I said, we work rights-based. So this, this is our main uh, legal framework that we, uh, we relate to, the Declaration of Human Rights. As you know, uh, violence against women is said to be the biggest human rights violation on a global scale, sort of globally. We have the CEDAW, uh, which we had the 25 year anniversary this year, but it was uh, really difficult to, uh, to celebrate. Oh, sorry, that was a Beijing, sorry, but we have the CEDAW convention. We have the Istanbul convention and of course, national legislation. So just to look at it from a global perspective, um, one in three women experience physical or sexual violence in their lifetime. And in Europe, particularly intimate partner violence, we have a lot of statistics on that, varies from country to country. Um, uh, but on a global scale, 75% of all women are exposed to intimate partner violence during their lifetime. And in all countries, also in Denmark, women are at great, the greatest risk of being killed is in their own homes rather than in the public sphere. So if we look at the scope of uh, gender-based violence in Denmark, from surveys, we know that 38,000 women are exposed to physical violence every year. These are the latest figures. And four, four out of 100 women experience psychological violence, which is approximately twice as many. The same surveys also look at men subjected to intimate partner violence. Uh, here, the, the figure for men in Denmark are 19, and one out of 100 when it comes to psychological violence. Stalking is also a, a type of violence that disproportionately affects women. So 63% of the approximately 100,000 stalked every year in Denmark are women, mainly by partners or ex-partners, uh, the stalking, but there are five different types of stalking. So, uh, but particularly ex-partner violence is uh, gender-based. Then we have the rape statistics, which goes from those that had been um, reported to the police to figures you get from surveys. So the figure is between somewhere between 6,500 and 24,000. Some would even think that they were higher. So, uh, so quite a, a huge number as well. And then uh, on average for the past 25 years, 12 women per year are killed by a partner or ex-partner. Uh, most cases, there had been intimate partner violence in the relationship leading up to these killings. And if I have time, I'll, I can go more into details about that. So um, as it is about gender-based violence, I know that we are focusing also on violence against women. It's interesting that surveys do not really provide much data for non-binary gender identities. Maybe in the future, they will. But, but currently, it's very binary data we are getting from these surveys. So um, it's clear that uh, violence is proportionally uh, particularly also intimate partner violence, um, uh, which we're talking about in this content, uh, affect women. Um, but there are other, sort of within that group, there are other vulnerabilities, for instance, age, uh, educational background, and also minority, and particularly migration background, is a huge um, uh, contributing factor in terms of vulnerability uh, to be exposed to violence. Um, and also, of course, women are disproportionately affected by sexual harassment in both the workplace and the public sphere. 
um, as well as digital types of, of violence revenge porns and other types of, of digitally, uh, digital facilitated uh, abuses and violent acts. Um, yeah, so it's clear that it is a gendered phenomenon. It is something that disproportionately affects women. However, we have experienced in the past, I've put 10 plus years, but 15, 20 years, um, and sort of increasingly a gender neutralized uh, discourse around particularly intimate uh, partner violence. This is not um, surprising. It was uh, it's sort of inspired by uh, some influences uh, from from US, from the UK. We see this happening in many countries. Uh, fathers' rights movements have also pushed this agenda. Uh, but what's interesting is when you look at the policy level in Denmark, when you look at the, um, and I'm just keeping an eye on my time, when you look at the um, the action plans developed by the Ministry of uh, Gender Equality uh, throughout the years in Denmark, you see this shift from the first action plan published in 2004 was actually called Men's Violence Against Women. Uh, then it becomes more, then it becomes violence against women, then it becomes intimate partner violence, and it becomes more and more neutralized in the wording they're using. But also when you look inside, what initiatives are they proposing? So they go from identifying the, the, the victims of violence or the survivors as women and the perpetrators as men. And then the latest one, actually, they are identifying both women and men as, uh, as victims, you could say. But the only gender assigned to perpetrators is in a discussion of how men are, you know, the, the perpetrators when men are subjected to violence are women. So you see this shift where, uh, the, this shift of, how they the sort of um, not just a neutralization, but also a shift in women being looked upon as perpetrators rather than uh, victims of violence. Uh, it of course also has an effect on how resources are allocated, uh, how policies are being developed and what is the focus of uh, interventions also from a political level. Uh, but we also see it in the public uh, debate and uh, when you troll through our uh, Facebook uh, page and see the comments we get in uh, to some of uh, whatever we are putting up there, the constant question we are getting is why are you not uh, focusing on all the men who are subjected to violence? So there's this shift in, in discourse and this shift in focus, both in the public sphere and in, in, the, uh, in, in policy. So of course, we are trying to do our best to um, to push back on that, not to neglect the fact that some men are subjected to violence, but it becomes more or less a zero sum game. So, so the focus is now on men being the victims and women being the perpetrators. And at the same time, focus cannot also be on, on, on women being uh, victims of violence, apparently. So we're trying to push back on this, but we also see it as an, an we're reversing to an individualization or privatization of the violence. So what the women's movement did really well is trying to push this agenda this, that this is a, um, a structural issue and it's a public issue, it's not a private issue. So, so when you look at this as the, the socio-ecological model where you can, you can sort of try and analyze the sort of the, uh, the underlying causes of uh, intimate partner violence or gender-based violence, um, we, we believe that you would need to, to look at all these four spheres. It could be a fifth sphere, with, sphere which is the global spheres, because you have global inequality are also uh, playing a role when you look at uh, how uh, migrant women in Denmark are um, disproportionately uh, affected by gender-based violence. This is, there's also an issue there of, of, of uh, women poor women uh, marrying Danish men and being more vulnerable to violence uh, in that process. Um, but, but there is this push towards looking at it as a very individualized uh, problem. It's about two people in a bad relationship and maybe one is violent to the other, maybe one is, or well, they're both violent to each other, but the structural or uh, sort of underpinning um, um, uh, causes are left out of that analysis. And, and um, 
my view is that if we do that, then we will never be able to, to prevent and combat this uh, problem. Um, so that's the shift we're seeing. So just we, we operate with these uh, four uh, main groups of violence. And just to lead up to me talking a little bit about how we mobilize around uh, having criminalization of uh, coercive control or psychological violence. So coercive control is really a set of tactics used by the abuser. So surrounding these tactics are physical or sexual violence or the threat of it. And then you have these, this is the Duluth model, it's, they have identified eight different kinds of tactics in, ranging from intimidation to emotional abuse, isolation, blaming, using children, economic abuse, male privilege and, and cohesion and threats. Um, and what we see, particularly for women who are coming into the shelters, about 2,000 of those 80, uh, 38,000 women or actually the ones, uh, the 72,000 subjected to psychological abuse uh, are, stay in a shelter in Denmark every year. And what we can see is that about half of them when they, when they first arrive, they have PTSD or symptoms of PTSD. And what we have identified is that this stems from the psychological violence rather than the physical or sexual violence. It is this, uh, this living a life in constant fear. So psychological violence is a pattern of behaviors that sort of uh, occurs over time and increases in intensity. So whereas a physical violent act or, or, or sexual assault is sort of, um, you can root that in, in space and time. This is something that happens over a period. And that's why it was really difficult to initially uh, get um, politicians, um, uh, lawyers, uh, judges to sort of mm, really engage in this because how were you gonna criminalize something that you couldn't actually uh, sort of go to the police and say, on that date at that time, this happened. This is, this is a very different way of a, a lot of other things in the penal code because this is not a single incident. This is a pattern of incidents. Um, so, so we really had to work hard to engage in a dialogue with the, the different uh, actors. So we, we, we decided we needed to, to improve the rights and protection of women and also men, but mainly women are subjected to coercive control. Um, we have that from a lot of international uh, uh, research. So, but uh, we just developed, we said, there's a three strings idea. We have to capacity build both frontal assault for those others. We have to make sure that they know what to look for. Then we have to ad advocate for criminalization of coercive control, and we have to increase awareness. In order to get the criminalization, we have to increase awareness both on the political and on the, in the political and in the public sphere. Um, so this is what we did and it's a lot of different things. Basically, uh, we, we did signature collection, we partnered up with other civil society actors. Uh, the Grevio uh, had just reviewed uh, the Danish implementation of the, um, of the Istanbul Convention. And this was one of the things that they were actually criticizing in Denmark that we had not yet criminalized psychological violence. So we used that and we spoke to the Grevio. Um, um, yeah, uh, we spoke to Grevio about it and we spoke to other civil society actors in other countries, particularly in the UK where had, they had criminalized already. We spoke to actors in Norway where they are quite progressive on the legislation and also police are quite uh, progressive. And um, yeah, so, so we tried to engage both on a civil society, political level, we looked internationally and we looked also in the national um, arena. And uh, we managed to, and, uh, and I think one of the things that made a huge difference was that we, we invited the then Ministry of Justice to our shelter where he had a, a private conversation with one of the women here and she told her what her everyday life had been like. And all of a sudden he realized what it meant to live in a, an abusive relationship with coercive control. So how you are living a, a, a life in fear with no free will at all. So you are constantly focusing on how to de-escalate, how to handle and how to, um, what are your strategies versus his tactics. 
and and I, it made a huge difference and and he became a great advocate and and actually when on april 2nd uh, 2019 uh, all members of parliament voted for this legislation and this was um we had not uh, really uh, hope for this that we hadn't dared to hope for that to happen so so now it's we're coming up to the two-year anniversary and we're looking into now to see how's the implementation going i hope that was 15 minutes thank you very much thank you very much Madam. it was exactly on time thanks a lot um yes i'll pass the word over to uh, lisa please Thank you very much. I'll just see if I can share my screen here. Um, yeah, perhaps Madame Marie should just unshare. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you all for joining. My name is Lisa Johansson. I'm the director of the Women's Council in Denmark. We have a 46 member organization. Dana uh, is one of them. Um, and all these uh, different uh, organizations represent uh, different uh, um, aspects of the Danish society, political parties, women's rights organizations, uh, and unions, um, just to mention some of them. We work on uh, women's rights, so the right to, to live uh, a life without violence, also the right to, to be part of society, um, the political rights uh, to be equal with men, and so on. Um, and I must say, uh, working uh, with uh, women's rights, it's not a, 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 an uncontroversial uh, area. In fact, uh, it's a huge uh, battleground. You see it internationally, and we see it also uh, uh, in Denmark. Uh, in this uh, introduction to this webinar, you mentioned um, two uh, international, uh, very important uh, uh, declarations. One of them is from 93, uh, the UN Declaration on Violence Against Women. Uh, you also mentioned the very recent Geneva uh, Consensus Declaration, uh, which is very worrying on the topic of uh, women's rights. Uh, as Mette Marie mentioned, uh, one of the very important uh, conventions for us when talking about violence against women is the Istanbul Convention. This is also a battleground in the EU right now. Um, you see countries not wanting to ratify it and wanting, wanting to withdraw from the convention. And you see on the other side, the EU Commission wanting to uh, actually uh, ratify the convention on EU uh, scale. Um, so this is a, a huge battleground in the EU right now. But the reason I'm also introducing you to the convention is that in fact this convention has been very important for the mobilization uh, against violence against women in Denmark. Madame Marie mentioned um, the effect that this uh, convention and the later uh, uh, process uh, with the Grevio, the expert uh, commission and the expert group on the convention, uh, the significance it had on mobilizing uh, for uh, criminalizing uh, psychological violence. It has also been very important uh, for the mobilization against sexual violence in Denmark. So the convention is from, uh, a, a, from 2011 and it was ratified in Denmark in 14. And then uh, we had the first uh, uh, visit <laughs> or the first uh, um, uh, investigation by the Gravio uh, in 17. Um, this whole process with, uh, with Gravio, uh, you have to involve the, the civil society. And in this process, a lot of things came up uh, uh, 
as Madam Marie mentioned, on psychological violence, but also on sexual uh, violence. So this convention, just to put a few words on it, um, it's a convention that protects, uh, that wants to protect women and prevent and prosecute and eliminate gender-based violence. The reason that you see this uh, battleground <laughs> around the convention right now is that uh, it targets uh, gender stereotypes uh, for combating uh, gender-based violence. So again, it has this structural uh, focus that Mene Marie mentioned before, that when you look at gender-based violence, it's not an individual problem, it's a structural problem. If you have to deal and eliminate gender-based violence, you have to look at gender stereotypes and the role that they play in gender-based violence. Um, so this is also uh, for some uh, countries uh, a, a provoking uh, um, stand it takes, you can say. Um, but it's also a very, very important and necessary way to look at gender-based violence that is a st structural thing that you have to target. Um, one of the things um, uh, Grebio mentioned, apart from, from the problem with psychological violence, was the thing on uh, rape legislation in Denmark. Uh, because according to the Istanbul Convention, rape is defined as uh, sex without consent. Uh, I don't have the exact wording right here, but it basically is uh, uh, the definition they put up. So uh, this was presented to the Danish government in, in these uh, uh, reports. And the government said, well, that's also how we look at it in Denmark. However, uh, when uh, and that was amnesty that would look into all the the uh, the numbers and all the the uh, uh, the cases that were actually brought to court, you could see that only cases that would where you could actually uh, document physical uh, uh, violence would have a chance in the courtroom. So. Uh, in practice, there was not a focus on consent, but on how much the victim would fight against the perpetrator. Um, so um, uh, the civil society used this opportunity uh, with the Istanbul Convention and uh, the civil society reports and also the report from Gravio to actually mobilize around this issue about consent. Around the same time, we got a report uh, from the Danish Institute of Public Health showing alarming numbers on rape. Uh, and they were far from the numbers that we would get from uh, uh, official reports. So where earlier numbers said that around 5,000 Danish women uh, were raped every year. The new reports showed that up to uh, uh, 25,000, uh, perhaps even more women uh, were raped in Denmark every year. So there was a huge gap from uh, the numbers that we had before and these numbers that uh, the Institute of Public Health could uh, could suddenly show. So this happened on the same time. Uh, we also saw uh, some very important personal stories from victims, not only uh, uh, how little chance they had of getting justice, but also on how they were met by, uh, by police, for example. Um, so suddenly they started to, to become a lot of, of of uh, uh, attention on, on these uh, cases and also together with the numbers, uh, we started to get some public attention on the issue. Um, you can say this Istanbul Convention uh, process uh, gave us a chance to, to also uh, form this alliance between human rights organizations, survivors, not at least because these personal stories 
became very, very important in this mobilization and then the women's rights movement. movement. And then I just want to uh, touch upon the recent developments we've seen in Denmark because uh, we had this whole mobilization on, uh, on rape legislation and this, the story is the same as uh, Madame Marie told before that uh, on the 17th of December, we expect this uh, new uh, rape legislation to, to be adopted in the Danish parliament and with support of all parties in the parliament. So uh, it's kind of the same story that this mobilization actually in a very few years have really created a big public support for this case. So when we reached August uh, 2020, um, people had already been mobilized on this issue on sexual violence and the year before on psychological violence. So when our famous TV star, Sophie Linde, went on stage in August 2020, telling her own story on, on sexual uh, uh, violence. Uh, it triggered a, a, an atmosphere that was already created, as I see it. Um, and uh, uh, that's also the explanation, I would say, why we have this movement right now. In 17, this mobilization had not happened uh, in such a big scale yet, but now uh, we uh, now we had this uh, general awareness that that uh, we have a problem on on uh, on gender-based violence. Uh, so just to mention uh, what happened in this uh, mobilization and why it has been successful, uh, again uh, personal stories collective action uh, because people when comparing with the lost me to you movement in 2017 you can say that this time people or at least you could say especially women formed uh, um, uh, groups and petitions and they collected testimonies uh, and and they did this in alliance with media and when you look back at uh, Me Too in 2017, you actually saw that media were critical on, uh, uh, on the movement and on the personal and individual stories that came forward. This time, the stories came forward in huge numbers. Uh, women uh, stood together and formed uh, these uh, groups supporting each other and suddenly, uh, you know, the new heroes became these uh, victims who, 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 who showed that they owned their own stories and, and, and brought them uh, forward in the media. Um, so this uh, collective action uh, among women, women uh, mobilization, uh, and again with the women's movement, uh, women's rights movement at, as the backbone, I would say, and also uh, why it's important uh, also internationally to, to always be uh, supportive of, of women's uh, rights mobilizations and of uh, women's rights organizations because uh, it's um, important to support each other in, in coming forward uh, and telling uh, the stories. Um, yeah, so just to sum up um, uh, in the introduction for this web uh, webinar, it was also put forward what is successful mobilization, how to mobilize also men in this uh, uh, movement. Um, it's very important, we know that from the whole uh, story of of uh, the women's movement that uh, a successful mobilization is with the support of, of, uh, of all genders. Um, so it's very important. You also see right now, actually uh, as a result of Me Too, uh, or at least the last couple of years movement, you see a new men's uh, movement, feminist men's movement that support these uh, uh, developments. And it's very positive. 
Uh, yeah, and then again, just uh, to to again uh, highlight the very important role of of uh, women's uh, movements uh, to 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 be a backbone in 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 a mobilization like this. Okay, so that was uh, my uh, points. Thank you very much, Lisa. Great points. Um, and now I turn to you, Meren. The floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you, Lars, for inviting me to this uh, interesting seminar. It's really interesting to listen to the Danish experience. So my, in my talk is not going to be like the earlier speakers, but I'll be rather reflecting to the points they raised just to see some similarities and patterns uh, internationally. I really found the figures uh, which were mentioned by Meta Mari quite striking uh, because I'm one of the millions out there who believe that, you know, Scandinavians in general, especially uh, Denmark is somehow the epicenter for uh, women's rights issues and gender equality. So you have in a way proved me wrong, uh, which I'm really happy to learn. <laughs> and um, the presentation I think also makes us to question this common implicit assumption of uh, linearity between economic empowerment and freedom from violence. That's one thing I've uh, kept on reflecting. And uh, because there is this uh, assumption, underlying assumptions that you know, women's involvement in income generating activities and this economic empowerment of women always gives them this access to valuable resources, better negotiation power, and somehow also enhancing their uh, control and over choices and decision. Yeah, that's a, a assumption we mostly face. And again, it's believed that once women are economically empowered and they're uh, uh, accessing this uh, public sphere, uh, they somehow uh, are expanding their network and also they will have their, their self-esteem is somehow uh, also uh, considered to be quite uh, better off. But I want to highlight here, the reason why I'm raising this is I want to highlight here that there is really a need to critically reflect on the dominant trend we see in intervention programs, which are targeting violence against women. Because I see in countries like Ethiopia, there is this inclination toward this, this assumption of like enhancing women's economic power where somehow automatically translate into protection from violence, which the Danish experience is somehow uh, um, challenging, I, I say, I would say. So in the Ethiopian context, what we see is, for example, I can just refer to my uh, own recent uh, research on uh, uh, women in, employed in the manufacturing industry. Ethiopia is becoming the Bangladesh of uh, Africa, so to say, with this uh, uh, textile and uh, garment industry. And as we all know, textile and garment sector is highly gendered. And the way the uh, policymakers are somehow promoting this uh, manufacturing industry is saying, you know, we are creating employment opportunity for women. And when you push further and we do like interview with policymakers, activists, um, the one of the explanation given is, of course, when women are economically empowered, they will be less exposed to gender-based violence. So the, there is this mentality, the, they are operating with this implicit assumption of linearity between economic empowerment and protection from violence. So I think we need to uh, reflect on that in countries like Ethiopia and uh, most uh, countries in the global south. And um, so uh, the trend we see is, so it makes us to challenge this assumption. And my question for all of us as a kind of reflection to get back to is, what do we need to bring to the equation? I mean, to deliver on the protection of women from violence. So for my country and you know, other countries, which are at this euphoria of promoting uh, women's employment, uh, there is a lot to learn from the Danish experience, I would say. So uh, I just want to end with this question of like, we really need to ask, is the predominance of gender-based violence despite or because of economic empowerment or both? So I think this is uh, one question I just want to uh, bring. And uh, moving to the other theme of uh, Meta Maria's point on coercive control, we are on the same page. We Ethiopia is also 
still, uh, I mean, we are not even discussing about it, uh, let alone criminalizing it. So this remains as a kind of legal battlefield for most countries and uh, uh, even developed ones like Australia, where they are still debating uh, whether to criminalize or not criminalize it. So um, on this point of coercive control on the criminalization, there are two main points I want to reflect on. One is on the evidential difficulty. And the second is on the enforcement of the law itself, because now it's almost two years yeah, in, since it has been criminalized. On my first point of evidential difficulty, we all know that the nature of uh, coercive control is quite individual, right? So it's it's mostly happening in, in a private setting uh, where finding evidence or verifying becomes quite an issue. So I'm just curious to know if in the Danish context also this issue of evidential difficulty is also reflected in the uh, legal, uh, in the revised criminal code if they have, uh, if it's really duly controlled, because it's one thing to criminalize the act. And on the other hand, if we just uh, forget to address also these issues of like uh, evidence and verification, it might be also half kind of criminal, uh, half kind of uh, criminalization, I would say. So uh, it will be really interesting to reflect on that as well. And again, enforcement is also equally important. I know that this, uh, that it's, we are, we will be all looking forward to the report which is coming out. I'm personally interested after hearing about the context in Denmark. But regarding uh, enforcement, the point I want to raise is even for the few uh, laws uh, we have uh, here, like protecting the rights of women, or when we look at enforcement, it's quite an issue for various reasons. There is a, a problem with enforcement. One might be because of capacity gap. On the other hand, uh, there is also this subtle, subversive act by different powerful interest group. And I'm just wondering how the context is in Denmark, but is uh, so it will be interesting to look at the enforcement because we have here um, very well uh, uh, kind of uh, articulated uh, laws in, for some uh, gender-based violence uh, acts, but when it comes to enforcement, it's quite an issue and it will be really interesting to look into those things. And coming to the presentation by Lisa and the points I take from that, uh, one of the thing is, again, we are on the same page on the consent-based uh, sex, uh, uh, I mean, rape. Uh, I'm intrigued again uh, because the reality doesn't really tally with the image we often have, again, of uh, uh, Scandinavia in general being this epicenter for women's rights, as I've said. And referring to the Ethiopian case in our uh, penal code was uh, revised in 2004 and uh, the rape law was one of the issues which has been also uh, discussed and revised slightly, but, uh, but still it has uh, quite a number of issues, especially like marital rape is not outlawed, uh, again, consent is not considered. So according to the Ethiopian um, legal framework, uh, it's only when the offender uses violence or when he threatens to use violence that the law presumes absence of consent. So uh, the concept of pre-consent is totally ignored in this context, in the Ethiopian context as well. Uh, so it's always the burden of proof is on the survivor. Uh, she has to prove that she there was this resistance from her side as well. So the, the, it's, it's under discussion, but it's not really the well mobilized and we don't have a campaign which is actively working on cr criminalizing uh, this act. But uh, the point I want to raise here is on the structural factors which might contribute to the criminalization of some acts. And just to draw your attention to the Ethiopian case, uh, for instance, for the last almost 10 years, from 2009 to 2019, in Ethiopia, we did not have this conducive environment to come up or to campaign for uh, 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 criminalization of some acts. Uh, this was a time when we had, when there was a very restrictive proclamation, uh, which was Meron, I think we lost you here. 
at least I don't hear anything. And your picture has frozen. Let us just oh, wait. That is yep. getting there from oh yeah, can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. So if you can go back one minute. <laughs> ah. I'm sorry, I think we lost you again. Hmm. Um, perhaps you should disconnect and join again. And then in the meanwhile, we could just take a couple of questions uh, here. Sorry, ah. yeah. So Hello, oh. can you hear me now? Yes. I think I'll just stay off the video because sometimes I am, I, my network is not stable, so it might be better just to, or yeah. I'll, I'll just turn it on and then when it goes off, I'll just stay away from the video. Let's give it a try one more time. Yes. Yeah. So I was uh, mentioning about the uh, environment, uh, the, the conducive environments being uh, one factor in the criminalization of some acts. And I was um, mentioning about the uh, law in Ethiopia from 2009 to 2019, there was a proclamation which was quite restrictive. Sorry, now you are not with us again. Uh, Miran, I think you you have to disconnect and, and connect again. Um, meanwhile, I think it is uh, there are a couple of questions and uh, or oh, actually and uh, just work on rights issue considered as political work. Uh, anything which has uh, to do. I think it this. Uh, yeah, hello again, Miran. Yeah, hello. Can you hear me now? Yes, perhaps you should, uh, as you said, uh, just uh, uh, disconnect your, oh. yeah. Yeah, um, so if you can hear me. Yes, we can. Good, so I'll just stay away from the video, yeah. So uh, I'll again go back to this point, sorry about that. Uh, it's the network that we are having here. So. Sorry, now we lost you again, uh, Miran. I think we just uh, take a couple of questions here uh, and hope that uh, your connection will improve and then um, and get back to your points about the context. Uh, and I think it's very important so, so we could get that uh, subsequently. Um, but just uh, for now, I think I would like to just uh, highlight a, a couple of questions we have here, uh, a pretty, um, uh, concrete uh, questions, both relating to- So from to, 2009 to 2019, we had a SOS receiving more than 10 million. But Miran, I think you should wait um, just a moment because uh, you are on and off. So um, um, there was a point raised uh, by Miran actually about implementation. And I think, uh, so how do we actually take this legislation into reality, uh, this new, uh, couple of, of, of uh, laws coming, one coming through hopefully later in December and one uh, earlier in 2017. And there's also a question to, to whether the police get any education um, so they can help women. Um, I, it could be good if, if you would like to um, uh, relate to that. But also there's a pretty concrete question to you, Mette Marie, uh, regarding intimate partner violence, whether that is directly uh, against women or men for that matter, um, or it is also including uh, violence against children and being witness uh, to that kind of, 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 um, of violence. So those are a couple of, of uh, fairly concrete uh, questions. Uh, perhaps, Madame Marie, if you could uh, enlighten us a bit on those. 
Yes, thank you. Let me start with the last one. Um, so the, the figures I, I showed on my slides, they were for uh, those directly uh, victimized or affected. Uh, uh, when you look at other statistics around violence against children, it's about 33,000 children per year who are in surveys. Um, uh, direct, uh, directly uh, subjected to violence. But I, we would uh, view children who are witnessing psychological violence and physical violence and sexual violence uh, because they do, whether they see it or they just hear it, but they do witness it. We consider them to be also uh, victims of uh, the violence because they are also uh, reacting in ways uh, similar to if they had been directly subjected. So when we have women staying with their children here, we give, um, of course we do some, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a treatment center, but we have psychologists here and those, particularly the children, we do have a lot of uh, sort of activities and also sessions with the psychologists for them to work through this experience and, and process it and uh, hopefully get out uh, on the other side, um, having um, sort of healed uh, at least to some degree from what they have experienced. So, so we would view that as indirectly being a witness it might be indirect victims, but but the consequences are the same. So so that was to that. Then then, if I can take both the implementation and, and the the education of the police, actually these days politicians we're hoping that they are finalizing it today, maybe it's tomorrow, but they're actually negotiating another uh, four year um, agreement for the Danish police and how what to focus on and how to develop. We have lobbied really hard <laughs> and uh, for them to include uh, some, mm, a special focus on gender-based violence. Uh, what we have suggested is that they create special units in all 12 police districts in Denmark, where they have specialized knowledge around gender-based violence, both uh, intimate partner violence and sexual violence and other times of gender-based violence, both to understand the dynamics around it, but also that they get some knowledge and education around um, sort of trauma, how traumatized uh, victims react. Because what we experience both from intimate partner violence cases, but also rape cases is that uh, these um, women are interviewed, they try to report, but the police do not, they do not feel or recognize they react the reactions they have so they they really find it difficult to share their story in a in a way that um, uh, what they have experienced is uh, recognized uh, by the police and the police find it really uh, difficult to investigate in a quality where they know that they'll be able to take this to trial so, so there's the police. We've also been in, in contact with, with different of the uh, different, uh, um, uh, yeah, police from, from, from several places in Denmark who are actually requesting this uh, knowledge because they know they have an issue. And I think uh, just from a personal stand of view, I think they have, I think for years, we haven't really viewed this as uh, criminal offenses, not saying rapes, but rapes on the street, yes. But intimate partner rape is the most common type of rape. When we haven't really, it's not, it's illegal, but it's not really viewed upon as a crime or it has not been. So it has not been investigated as such either. So I think that the, so that was, I, I hope that the, the new uh, framework would actually uh, provide some, some focus on this and hopefully also some resources because Normally, that's what you also need, some focus resources for that. Uh, and and the, the last bit about the implementation of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the criminalization of psychological violence, I think that we are looking at it now. So the few cases that have been, have been a collective of physical, sexual, or physical and psychological violence. So either physical, sexual, and psychological violence, or just physical and psychological violence. So I think we also, I think we have to allow time 
for that implementation because it is a very um, both how are the uh, police going to investigate and secure evidence but there is a lot of digital evidence actually because a lot of these the, the a lot of the coercive control has moved to di uh, digital platforms so you might they might have 100 text messages per day or they have had gps trackers on on their phones that they had to or they had uh, sort of hidden uh, apps so that they have that their location has been uh, um, the yeah uh, where they've been has been been tracked by the perpetrator so i think there's some digital uh, sort of evidence that can be but it's also again back to the education of the police they need to know what coercive control is in order to investigate i had we had actually a group of police officers here we were doing a, a just a brief workshop for them and there's another model that we we use also when in our uh, dialogue with with the women who are staying at the shelter and it's called the spiral of violence and it shows how it's a slow process from moving from the initial phases of a you fall in love and to sort of where you're completely isolated and the uh, one from the prosecutor's office in that particular uh, um, uh, police station was there and she said well if i started asking questions moving along this spiral of violence then i can actually better investigate whether sort of sort of the, the incidents that actually does all in all make up uh, sort of the, the whole history of violence and then maybe have a, a, both be better at interviewing the victims but also be better at presenting the evidence so i think um i hope that answers the questions so i think we should allow we have to be a little bit patient with the with the courts also it's a new legislation but uh, not too patient. We also have to push. So yeah. Thank you very much. Not too patient, but too uh, patient. a little bit patient at least. <laughs> uh, meaning also, as Miron pointed out, that there is also certainly also something to learn in the implementation phase uh, for for the authorities who have to uh, bring this uh, new legislation into reality. Uh, thank you very much, Miron. It looks like you have found a new connection. Um, if I'd very much like to hear what you would like to say about um, the context and, and uh, whether it is a conducive environment or not for, for some of these issues. So if you could uh, take up your presentation at that point. Yeah, um, yeah, sorry about the uh, network again, but I think it will be stable this time around. Uh, I was mentioning about this point on uh, because Lisa also told us on how the mobilization process looked like in Denmark where government, of, I mean, govern, some government officials, the, co the local community, especially the youth has been part of the whole movement. And I was uh, commenting on that point, saying that uh, for such kind of mobilization, we really need a conducive environment in terms of uh, the, uh, the absence of democratic environment by itself can be a factor. I'm drawing to the Ethiopian uh, example here, and also the presence of less or at least low uh, repressive uh, laws is also important because I'm just referring to the context of Ethiopia from 2009 to 2019 we had a civil society uh, civil societies were not really operating in full capacity because of a proclamation which was constraining their uh, uh, capacity and this they were not allowed to work on some sensitive issues which are considered to be political including women's rights children's rights issues, disabled people, uh, peace, security, you know, it's, a, it's like broadly defined what is political is quite broadly defined. And in such kind of context, it's quite difficult to um, come up with any uh, movement which calls for uh, uh, criminalization of some acts, including uh, the consent uh, based uh, rape we, we were, sex we were talking about. So. Uh, I was, I just wanted to make a point that the political environment itself is really quite important. And coming to the Me Too movement, the example uh, you gave, uh, I, I was thinking of the context specificity of uh, such movements, uh, because, um, well, the whole idea of the Me Too uh, movement and other movements uh, is basically to bring the issue to light because we don't get to hear much about it being said. And again, punishing the responsible uh, ones. And that punishment is believed to have this deterrent effect. Yeah, that's the whole 
uh, mm. idea of having such movements. But uh, sometimes we also see that such movements have a backlash. And I just wanted to draw your attention to such incidents drawing on the Ethiopian uh, example. We uh, had um, a, fam a famous Ethiopian popular artist somehow spoke about her own experience. It, it's not within the context of the Me Too movement, but she just experienced, she, she was speaking in public about what she had encountered as a young girl. And that has been ridiculed. That has been, uh, you know, she even faced more social ostracization. So I was just thinking of this and I was uh, thinking of the cultural pr framing of global movements, how important it is to reflect on that. Um, and uh, so because sometimes this might be inadvertently discredit the, you know, the noble cause which the movement is standing for. And that's what has happened in the Ethiopian context. And so uh, I thought maybe it might be interesting to think of the specificity of the context when we think of global uh, movements which are calling for uh, uh, women's rights issues. So what shapes the receptivity of the movement in the Danish context, it seems the the fact that this public figure took up on the issue has somehow, uh, uh, people have rallied around that cause, but uh, in the context of Ethiopia and other places, this is not the trend we see much happening. So the backlash of such global uh, movements is a point I wanted to raise. So, yeah. yeah I'm thanks just talking so before the network cuts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks a lot, Miron. Uh, very good points. Uh, I think they um, speak to uh, also to a question that has been raised, and Lisa, perhaps you could uh, comment on that. Uh, that's the question of, of whether um, the majority of the Danish population actually knows about the uh, um, uh, Istanbul Convention. Um, and is there a discussion among people, uh, and what are the different approaches to it in Denmark? Um, and I think that also... Um, Points to, to to something that I was thinking of when you uh, presented, namely um, uh, this um, movement in in the last four months in Denmark, where where uh, sexual abuse of of um, powerful men uh, in particular positions have really been put on the agenda. Um, and you said that, that uh, it's partly due to a media interest and partly due to a mobilization of women actually uh, presenting these points uh, very forcefully. Um, and there I'm a little bit um, uh, wondering whether the media is, it's very, it's necessary, but do they really want to take, put this issue on the agenda? It's to me, to, uh, I could actually say that it's primarily because they have been able to identify political leaders whom they have been able to criticize strongly on this point. But if there were no such political leaders or public figures that they could take up and, and uh, target in, in, in their articles, I wonder whether the media actually would have supported this uh, so strongly. So um, a couple of questions here, the Istanbul uh, Convention and, and the media in, in Denmark. Lisa, could you? Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for the questions. And I really apologize for not showing my slides. I hope it made sense to all of you. <laughs> um, yeah, first of all, the, the role of the media. Uh, of course, there's a lot of sensation uh, in, in uh, focusing on uh, particular politicians. However, uh, you have seen media um, playing an important role in, uh, in these petitions. That, that women would go together, uh, collect stories, and these stories were brought in media uh, and in huge numbers. And that's also the, the thing uh, I would say in, uh, uh, as a comment to, to your uh, questions, Miron, that uh, the whole difference is that compared to 2017, women have come out in numbers this time. So in 17, you saw single cases of women standing there alone with their stories. They were easy to attack. Uh, this time we have, or women in huge numbers have organized and standing together. So when one woman tells her story, there are many thousands of women behind her. So um, I think that made a huge difference. And I would still, uh, 
say that that this 2020 moment was and me too movement was only possible because we have mobilized on this for years uh, with the focus on on gender-based violence in in its different forms on psychological violence rape legislation and now uh, the thing that uh, that many women uh, have to face uh, sexual harassment in their work life so that's also another comment to the thing you were saying, Miran, that uh, women in Scandinavia, they are economically uh, independent. We are in large numbers in the labor market. However, this also exposes us to violence, or at least harassment um, and, and abuse. So, so that's the backside of this <laughs> um, gender equality that uh, you see with a lot of people in the working force. And coming back to that, uh, this whole mobilization also has to also had to 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 fight this uh, picture that we have of ourselves as a gender equal country. Uh, and it's very difficult to to challenge this uh, idea, we can see that in, in our own political setting, that it's a very important brand for Denmark to be gender equal. And that's also a, a thing we like to think of ourselves. So the, it, it's difficult also <laughs> for ourselves to, to start challenging exactly this picture. Um, and then coming back to the Istanbul Convention, uh, I think there's a lot more attention on it right now with the whole fighting going on in the EU and it has become so central in the EU uh, uh, on uh, European values right now. So I think a lot of Danes uh, start to, to become more aware of the Istanbul Convention. However, uh, I was just mentioning it because it has been central in this whole, whole mobilization and also on the very important laws that we will see pass, uh, that we've seen passed already and will see passed very uh, soon. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much. Um, uh, there's a, a question uh, actually reinforcing uh, one of Meron's points, namely um, the issue of, of the link it is between um, gender equality and violence against women on the one hand, and then uh, economic empowerment. Um, and, and perhaps, Maid Marie and, and Lisa, you could uh, just uh, relate a bit to that. Uh, how do you see this um, in, 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 a, in a Danish historical context? Would you think that there has been a move uh, with the economic empowerment towards more gender equality, and there is now some sort of backlash or some, as you, you, you mentioned, the, the, the Nordic paradox uh, why how should we explain this um, and, and how should we understand that uh, that was uh, at least one important question and then there was also um, a question uh, more directed to you Mermai, namely on on how can we um, change the common perception that victims of gender-based violence should react in a traumatized way uh, so when when Discussing this, uh, there may be sometimes a, a common um, uh, understanding that that one should behave in a particular way uh, in in these uh, issues. So, um, please, Medmai, perhaps you could go first. Yeah. So, uh, regarding the last question, I think what I was talking about is how are uh, people in authorities, like the police, or others, responding to the victims. So they need to understand how a traumatized person reacts in order for them to investigate a case. But I think that it's also equally important for us if we, because we always say that uh, for, at least when it comes to intimate partner violence, uh, sometimes <clears throat> you need someone to build that bridge between you and where you can get some support and protection. And so of course, uh, relatives, neighbors, friends, family, social workers, the doctor, uh, whoever, also needs to recognize uh, some of the signs of, for instance, a woman being subjected to co coercive control. <clears throat> physical violence is easier. They come to the emergency room with, with uh, physical uh, scars. But um, 
so so that's one way but i think actually now this whole debate around uh, consent based rape has done an immense i mean have have helped us immensely because we've had a lot of discussions of how do women react when being raped so we had this public perception that they would scream and shout and kick and if they didn't maybe we knew uh, maybe they were just sort of consenting in a nonverbal way uh, so this whole discussion about how 70% of rape victims actually freeze in the situation, I think that, that that has been, maybe not everybody in Denmark knows it, but at least it has been a part of the debate. And I think, so you should, I think my point is you have to do both. You have to raise awareness because if you need uh, public support and public um, support, not just directly to the victim, but also for uh, actually trying to prevent uh, more uh, violence, uh, they need to have an, a level of understanding where they can uh, recognize what is going on next door or with their sister. Uh, but of course, uh, those who sit in um, uh, sort of public authority figures, uh, the police or the, uh, the doctor, the municipality, uh, social worker, whatever, they need to have a, a, a general uh, or increase their knowledge to, to actually be the support they, they need to be for these women. Um, regarding the Nordic paradox, I, 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 I usually say, uh, I don't know if there is one, to be honest. And uh, the reason I say that is that it's sort of looking at very structural uh, legislative parameters saying we have gender equality because we have the equal pay law, do, 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 we have non-discrimination law. But when you look at how, for instance, power is di distributed, in Danish society, you see huge inequality. If you look also within the households, both sort of uh, looking at wage levels for men and women, but also unpaid care work, women are still doing the main part. So we still have quite sort of gender stereotypical sort of ways of looking at um, uh, heterosexual couples at least. So, and this is despite us being uh, very, very liberal and economically independent, but there are other parameters where really some of the norms that uh, were sort of uh, attached to a more, uh, less uh, gender equal society, we have not shedded all of those yet. So I don't, in, in that sense, that's why I think this, there's not so much of a paradox because until we do that, you don't have actual equality between men and women. Uh, so that's one thing. And then just more directly into this question of whether um, financial independence is, is sort of um, uh, pushing or pulling in terms of uh, the, the intimate partner violence. I think uh, on, on the, the long run, I think uh, economic independence for women is extremely important because it gives you options. It gives you options to to leave your perpetrator and seek an independent life. We can see that with some of our uh, sister organizations in uh, the global south, that these are just not options they have. So if you've been married when you are 14 year old Tunisian girl to a much older man, and when you are 17, you go to a shelter in Tunisia, you don't have a, an independent financial um, possibility or just standing outside the door when you leave the shelter. Um, in Afghanistan, it's even worse, of course. On the other hand, I think the process of uh, when uh, you move from totally financial dependency within your household to more independence, we, we do see how that can, in that process, violence can increase. So, but that's on a more individual level. So on an individual level, when you start gaining more and more independence, violence may increase because violence is about power and control and you're losing control. Uh, so the perpetrator is losing control. Uh, so, so I think it, it's not a straight answer, but I think in the long run, economic independence is one of the very, very important things if we are going to combat violence against women. Thank you very much, Madmai. Lisa, would you join here? I totally agree. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, economic uh, independence is uh, uh, crucial uh, for gender equality, uh, no doubt, uh, I would say. 
Um, and again, we can also rely to the thing uh, Mette Marie is, is saying, uh, we have partners also in the MENA. And uh, um, I mean, that's the, the huge challenge in the MENA region is exactly this thing that uh, women uh, do not have the economic independence. So, uh, so that's crucial. Um, uh, the thing that Mette Marie is mentioning about uh, that it's a double uh, sided uh, thing also is uh, again, uh, women working is still challenging gender stereotypes. And uh, that's also what, what uh, the Istanbul Convention is very precise in saying is that we have to, to challenge uh, these and uh, very uh, narrow gender stereotypes because they are triggering violence and not only against women but also against minorities that when you challenge this picture that you have of a perfect woman or like a, as a woman as she should be uh, staying in her home doing uh, uh, the household when you're challenging these you are uh, triggering uh, um, the, the expectations that people have uh, on your gender and that can ultimately ultimately also trigger violence. So it comes back to this that we have to work on stereotypes also. Uh, and we are doing that in Scandinavia by saying now in second generation and for some uh, fourth, fifth generation that women are of course working. Uh, and for some, it goes all the way back. Of course, women are working. So, I mean, this is challenging stereotypes that again, will give more space for women to be in, in different ways. And also, hopefully also for men to, to be masculine in different ways. And, and that's the, the, the long run in, in, in encompassing gender-based violence. Thank you very much. Um... There is one question about um, female genital mutilation (FGM) uh, in in Denmark, and and I think that relates to another point that I was thinking about, namely um, whether whether it is important to look upon um, age, education, and minority groups. Um, Marie, you mentioned it in your presentation that that um, this is often uh, targeted at a particular age group uh, and re related to educational level and and um, perhaps also to minority groups um, and and I, I think there's a, an issue here and and um, also perhaps explaining why um, it may be difficult for a broader Danish public to realize that this is important. I think th things have changed the recent uh, months, but but up until very recently, um, I, one can actually say that this was not an issue that was taken very seriously. So, so um, uh, there is a, here a question about uh, um, uh, particular groups, uh, whether this is also partly an explanation of why things have happened. And then there's this question about uh, FGM, what what do we do in Denmark in that respect, and, and do you actually address that issue? That is one thing. Then, um, uh, Miran, I see a couple of questions to your experience uh, uh, in Ethiopia, and perhaps that could also enlighten us uh, more broadly. Um, namely, one on on um, if as a, responding to your point about the Me Too movement and me. So you said that that was hadn't really mobilized so much in in Ethiopia. Then what what can uh, one do to mobilize around these issues in an Ethiopian context? And also a question about whether this leads to to uh, leads um, to that women uh, actually leave uh, the country, migrate away, or or does uh, does it um, does violence against women have implications in that uh, of that kind of uh, more demographic nature? Um, so if you could touch upon that, those are some of the questions that uh, have been raised. I just have to check whether there are, have come more. Yeah, but um, no, I think we'll stick to that right now. And and given that our time is is running out, Miran, perhaps you could um, comment on these two questions and also uh, address the issues that have been discussed and the remarks by Med Marie and Lise. Please, Miran. 
Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you for the questions. For with the first one on uh, the Me Too movement, uh, I just want to emphasize here that it's not that it's not totally working. But the point I was trying to make is also just to uh, let us discuss about the backlash. But uh, the regarding the question on this point of like, okay, what is it that that can be done to mobilize uh, people on the cause of gender-based violence in general? I'll uh, say that uh, one is maybe. Um, you know, to discuss and to bring about the local roots of the causes of, uh, uh, I mean, the causes of such movements. I mean, with the Me Too movement, the, often the criticism, I mean, the feedback we get from the public is that, okay, this is quite fashionable. So it's the elitist kind of movement or, uh, or which is targeting the social uh, uh, media platforms, which is only accessed by the few, so to say. So in this case, in the Ethiopian case, what we ha what I believe we have to do is to say that, well, the cause is, has some quite local roots. So the, you know, the platform really doesn't matter the way we communicate about it. But the thing is the cause which these such movements, including the Me Too, are targeting has some local roots. So to bring to the discussion that to, about, to discuss about the causes or, or than the platform or the means can be one way. And the second is maybe also to be creative and being innovative in the platforms we use in the local setting to use the grassroots level uh, to, you know, to, to, to operate at that level and try to use some uh, community-based public conversation on the issue can be one, one way to address it. Uh, so I can think of this too. Uh, points specifically on how best we can uh, think of mobilizing uh, people around different causes of gender-based violence. And uh, the, I'm not quite sure if I got the second question on the link between migration and gender-based violence, if that was, if that's the way the question goes. Um, well, uh, you know, I, I, I was uh, doing research in a different setting on uh, migration of women. Uh, because most of my, my uh, research, I focus on gender issues, and one of them is gender, uh, this labor migration of uh, Ethiopian female migrants going to the Middle East, mostly. And I was talking to some uh, migrant women in transit in Djibouti who are heading to Dubai and other uh, Gulf states. And one of the things you hear is, uh, I mean, there are cases, it's, it's, it's common to come across number of women who have faced violence while in Ethiopia and who decide to leave home because this is a, the violence happened to them by a family member. And so they couldn't talk about it. Uh, this takes us to the point we were uh, raising earlier about the coercive uh, uh, control and how much uh, you know, the evidence uh, production becomes quite difficult. And so for those women whom uh, I have interviewed and whom I have talked to, they openly say that, I mean, you know, if I speak about it while I'm back home, of course, this might cause some kind of uh, um, problem within the household level, uh, not only, so the survivor is thinking about the relationship of the family instead of herself. And that somehow, so she's being doubly impacted by the violence she's facing. So in this kind of circumstances, so running away becomes a solution. So that's the thing they, often end up sharing with me. So yeah, we, so if the question is like, if gender-based violence in a way links to the migration dynamics we see, yeah, it does. And that's something which I have uh, come across in a number of places and uh, both in, um, uh, among those who are in transit and at destination countries. Uh, so they, they are somehow mutually uh, related to one another. So. And also, if, uh, do you have any further comments on, on uh, the economic empowerment issue and the Nordic paradox? Yeah, on the economic empowerment issue, as I've said, um, uh, for me, always it, it's, it's really striking because we know that it's, there is a debate, uh, you know, whether uh, economic empowerment is a factor uh, for the violence or if it's uh, somehow um, a de-escalating factor. It's a, it's a highly debated thing, yeah? But the trend uh, we see, again, I'm referring, I'm sticking to the Ethiopian uh, example, just for us to uh, reflect on the context in Denmark as well. What we see happening here is really somehow uh, praising the empowerment, the economic empowerment as a way out of violence. Uh, so 
uh, that's the way uh, the government officials go about justifying why we need to have employed, you know, quite a number of women being employed in the manufacturing sector, in the, in the industrial parks, uh, where we have all this, uh, you know, the, all the big brands of Europe and North America are now entering the Ethiopian uh, manufacturing industry. So uh, the government promotes uh, the manufacturing sector saying this is creating, I mean, Gender is one of the cards which is raised by the government, officially saying that, well, this is creating employment opportunity for women. And when you push one step and ask, so is it all about creating job for women? No, it's also in a way contributing to uh, protecting them from violence. So for me, uh, listening to the Danish uh, example, uh, the, the experience which we have been uh, discussing here, it really makes us to reflect on this thing and also to question about the dominant trend we see in the global south of like linking economic empowerment with freedom from violence or at least protection from violence. So um, this is a point I want to make on this. Thank you very much. Uh, Med Marie, would you like to, to comment on, on uh, this about minority groups and FGM and in the Danish context? Yeah, I think FGM, I don't, uh, to be honest, I don't have uh, much knowledge more than just uh, what you, you read it with. It's not part of our program, but maybe Lisa, uh, maybe you know a bit more because you actually work with this in uh, Egypt. So I would leave that to you. But just to come and quickly, because it's really interesting also that, of course, one of the types of violence we see very um, uh, often about 35% of those staying in shelter is what we call economical violence. And that is designed to reduce the economic uh, uh, opportunities or independence. So, so and, and also, uh, so, so that was just a comment into that. So that's how that is tackled with in countries where women actually have economic independence. It's part of the pattern of violence is to, to reduce the economic independence uh, for some. That could be a tactic. Um, uh, re regarding uh, violence and migration, it's an interesting thing because just as violence leads to migration, there is uh, the, the opposite is also the case. Migration puts you at huge risk for psychological or sexual violence during the actual trip or the migration uh, process. Uh, but we can also see a lot of um, migrant uh, women in Denmark married to either uh, uh, second minority generation, second generation minority men here, or, or, or th those who have uh, been raised here, because what you need obviously is, or just ethnic Danish men, because what they are dependent on for them is uh, the uh, residency. So this leaves a huge vulnerability for them uh, to break free of, of violence. But, uh, and also what we can see is, for instance, um, uh, we have had a special engagement for uh, different kind of groups. I'll just focus down on the Southeast Asian uh, group of women that we were trying to reach out to. Uh, these had been uh, married to Danish men, most of them, uh, and they were both extremely vulnerable in order, in in terms of being subjected to and because of the, the power imbalance. But they had very little opportunities actually how to to. Uh, to break free from this violence, particularly if they've had children, because they would lose their residency and they would be repatriated. So there are some really severe and interesting links between violence and migration both ways. Thank you. Uh, Lisa, would you like to comment on this? Yes, and I guess this is my final remarks. <laughs> yes. Uh, in the matter of FGM, actually, we need uh, some uh, statistics on this in Denmark. Uh, in fact, uh, the whole uh, area of gender-based violence uh, is, uh, we have very little data on that uh, in general. Uh, and you can see, as I was saying before, that uh, um, numbers really matters also in the mobilization. So, uh, we are, we've just joined this Eurostat uh, survey that will start next year, uh, giving a full picture on gender-based violence in all the EU countries, including Denmark. Because we have the, the numbers on uh, shelters, we have now uh, uh, better statistics on rape, but the whole picture is something that's lacking and also on FGM. 
our experiences from uh, our partnerships in Egypt is that the whole regime on FGM is changing uh, because now it has been a very medicalized uh, issue. Um, so, uh, so actually we have to tackle it in a totally different way that uh, in fact, uh, we have to uh, address the universities who will teach in these things um, and get before we would we would think that it's, uh, you know, we have to go into the villages and we have to talk to the to the women. Uh, but in fact, it's an economic thing also because you have to pay for these things. So the, the, the men would always be included in these discussions. So we also have to reach men. We have to read the, reach the medical curriculum. Um, so we are also trying to, yeah, to, to understand these new, uh, new regimes on, on FGM uh, in Egypt, but also uh, we are trying to, to get a better picture of these things in Denmark. Uh, and then, yeah, I just want to say thank you for, for inviting us for this uh, discussion. Um, it's been really uh, interesting. And also, Maran, thank you for sharing your experiences uh, in this issue as well. I can only support this. Uh, thank you very much to, for good questions. And in particular, thank you very much to you uh, three presenters, uh, which have read, uh, who have really enlightened us on many different issues and also put this uh, international perspective on, on our experience and the paradox in, in a Danish uh, context. So um, thank you very much to all of you. And um, we hereby uh, say goodbye from, from these. <laughs>